Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hong Kong Museum of Art. It's our honor to have Mr. Frank Gehry to give us a lecture today. We are also pleased to have Mr. Tan Hong Chu, the Chief Curator of the Hong Kong Museum of Art, to give a welcome speech and an introduction on Mr. Gehry. May I invite Mr. Tan, please? Thank you very much, Tan, and you are also for Mr. Gehry's talk. So everyone should be familiar with Mr. Gary, who was born in Toronto, Canada, and studied at the University of South California and Harvard University. Over the span of his very successful career, he established an example of architecture company, which completed a number of very famous architectural projects uh, all over the world, as you know, the Guggenheim Bilbao, which gives the city a lot of new life, and what is the concert hall, as well as various other projects. I think the most important thing is that is uh, Mr. Gary's project and architectural design, which uh, is uh, really related to humanity and also addressed to the issues of the building itself and also the cultural context of the specific sites and also, uh, also the metric of the environment and nature, which gives us a very fresh outlook in architectural and spaces and cultural sites and things like that. Yeah, so, uh, I extend my warmest day welcome to Mr. Gary for coming to Hong Kong and all way to join this exhibition and share his uh, experience with us. So I pass that I still Mr. Gary. Thank you. I don't know why I'm here actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I have not been doing many lectures lately because I'm tired of looking at the same pictures. <laughs> um, just before I start, uh, are there are there's architects in the room, right? Architects, there's an architect. Some architects, put up your hand, architect. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you for a minute. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm talking to architects. In in my experience as an architect. Um, the, we are hired by a client to do a building, and we start work on the building. And they, uh, it's a nice, it's usually a love affair. Very, everybody likes everybody. They're, you uh, are very friendly, and uh, you design a building, work with them very carefully, and you design a building that's very uh, much to their needs and to their budget and all those important things. And then the project is put out to tender, and it's put out to tender, and it comes back and it's over budget. Have you experienced that? <laughs> and as soon as it's over budget, the client who has a, a specific amount of money to spend on this project then uh, loses trust in you as the architect because um, you've created this wonderful thing, but they can't afford it. And so they turn to the contractor, the construction company. And at that moment, the architect becomes infantilized and the construction the guy becomes parental. That's how I talk about it. And so for over the years, and I'm kind of old now, but over the years, I didn't like that idea. I didn't like being put in that position all the time. And I suppose you are young architects won't like that in the future. So I tried to figure out how do you how do you break this knot? How do you change it? How do you change the game? 
And by coincidence, I was doing shapes that needed help. And I got involved with the computer. It led me to um, uh, fancy aircraft computers and a relationship with uh, a French company, Dassault. Uh, the working on the projects with that, those, that software, I found that the, uh, the precision of that uh, kept me in power longer in the equation. So I didn't become the infant till much later. <laughs> I could stay parental longer. <laughs> and uh, that intrigued me. And so with a group of people, we started a, a, a group to explore how this could be better for the, for the industry for the architects and to take more responsibility for rather than less. And so we developed a separate company called GT and that's what this is all about. Um, and it's, um, it, it made it possible to do all these kinds of projects. And the uh, Bilbao project, for example, the uh, steel that builds that is uh, very complicated. And uh, we trained six separate uh, contractors to bid on the steel. And uh, when they bid, their bids came in, they were 18% under budget, which was amazing, and 1% difference between all, the, all six of them. So when you get that kind of response from construction, you realize that the, the uh, documents are precise and very uh, uh, safe to accept. Usually you get one contractor higher and one lower and all over the place. And, and when they built it, they, they were able to build it within that budget. They made uh, one mistake that uh, we, but we had 18% savings, so we were able to to give them a little extra money to cover their mistake. Um, next. So then this uh, idea started to be used by other people, which. Uh, uh, Ovarup used it with Herzog. And then uh, many other projects. And uh, Swire uh, from Hong Kong, who we were working with, uh, tried it on their, uh, uh, one of their projects, which is just completed in Hong Kong. Next. Uh, this separate company now has offices in all of these places, and uh, I don't know what they're doing, but the, everybody seems to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then the projects we're working on, this company's working on, are on all those blue and yellow spaces. So they're very uh, spread around. Nice. And in um, one of the projects, I don't know how really to explain all this because I'm the wrong guy, but we have an, a small office here uh, in Hong Kong. Um, this is uh, Manhattan, ground zero. And the problem is that if they build all of it at once, it'll be the biggest traffic jam in history. And nobody will be able to get to work, and the materials won't be able to get delivered on time, and there'll be a mess. So with this software, we were able to to analyze this problem and schedule all the pieces, and so everything runs smoothly. Because when materials are delivered to the site uh, prematurely, they're left and they they are wasted because they uh, they get ruined, they get trashed. Yeah. So this is uh, one island east of Swire, 
and it, it's built now, and we were uh, able to save uh, considerably on the construction costs with uh, by by the uh, by fast tracking and by minimizing the number of clashes in the field. Next. Uh, this is one example of the clashes that were found. Uh, you can see as the uh, the pieces of the building were brought up and delivered to the floor. They're very high tech. Huh? <laughs> and so then it got there and it was it collided with the formwork. And this was uh, predetermined, so it was avoided. And, uh, and uh, because we could model it before, and we were able to save, it says 42 days saved overall by avoiding those clashes. So uh, it's clear that this three-dimensional modeling is, is uh, valuable. Next. And so now we're involved with the Mexico City uh, subway system, which potentially has lots of clashes. <laughs> okay, next. Um, so now I'll show you some of the work. Uh, the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which I don't, I don't have pictures of the interior, but uh, and it's the, one of the buildings I use myself. So it's five years old, and I go to concerts there. And for the first two years, I couldn't, they didn't like me coming there because I picked out all the mistakes and everything. I drove everybody nuts, but uh, now I enjoy it. And, uh, but this, this uh, software helped us build this, and we worked with the acoustics and the feelings of the uh, orchestra to the audience to the uh, which all turned into a very successful mixture. And now this building, every night, every concert is sold out. So uh, the financial return from a successful architectural project is, it can be amazing. And I've just been discovering it, and I'm trying to figure out how to charge my clients for extra on the other side, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be nice to do? <laughs> Right, Patricia? <laughs> anyway, it is a it is a interesting byproduct when it's done right. Next. And this is the Millennium Park in Chicago, which is um, also a performing arts venue. I've enjoyed working with performing arts venues for a number of years, the Hollywood Bowl and uh, outdoor pavilions and several concert halls. And uh, it's very in in intense, like when you do an art museum. It, it's uh, very similar, actually, to me, that it's all about creating uh, a relationship between audience and performer. In the case of a museum, it's the, audi the viewer and the painting, or, this, or the artwork. And that's always the same issue in uh, in uh, performing arts and in art, uh, art and also in sports. So it's it's a, a very important issue to to think about. Next, in Paris, um, where is it? Where? Here. That's the Jardin de Climatation. It's a children's park. And when Bernard Arnold took me to visit this children's park and asked me if I would uh, help him design a museum for his uh, foundation collection, I thought I just entered a Proustian environment. <laughs> and it felt I, I was very emotional about it because of that. Uh, uh, Next, 
this is the design, but you can see the model's upstairs, so I forgot that it was upstairs, so you don't have to look at it too hard to It's better to look at it upstairs. Next. We started with uh, these kind of study models and did do many of them with every next. And the interiors, and it, it became obvious to us this needed to be two buildings, an outside building, which, which is a garden structure, and then a, an inside building, which is for galleries. And we studied many configurations. Next. Next. I do, I do tons of these kind of sketches. Uh, they don't make any sense until after the building's built, and then they make sense. <laughs> When I drew that, I didn't know. <laughs> Next. Next. This goes on for months and it drives the clients nuts because we're, we work within a tight frame schedule, a normal architect schedule, but um, they always, always, clients always see the one model and they say, oh, I like that, so do that. And then once we refine it, uh, because we have to refine it, right, before we so. This is showing the idea that between the interior building and the exterior building, there's, there's space. And uh, we're hoping to, that artists will, will participate in that. And uh, the model for art on the outside of the building is Chartres Cathedral, I think, right? Hasn't been done since then. Uh, the idea of the, if you were in this garden with the merry-go-round and the, and the different things that uh, are in a children's garden in relation to this, and then you see the art and then on the outside and then the art on the inside, it's kind of a, a continuum. Next. I don't know if they're going to do that, but... <laughs> um, I'm going to try and go through these quickly so people can ask questions. I'd rather have you ask questions. This is in Israel, uh, a very controversial project that was started five or some years ago. It only became controversial because uh, uh, there were discovered uh, uh, Muslim graves on near the site, which we didn't we knew about and didn't touch. But because the, on the existing site there's an existing parking garage, uh, we thought that many years ago they removed the graves. When we removed the parking lot, we found more graves. So it stopped. The, it became a political thing and it stopped the project for five years. Um, it's a center for uh, tolerance. The idea is people that hate each other will come here and meet and start to love each other. <laughs> uh, this is the museum. There's a children's museum. Uh, there's a conference center. There's a theater. Everybody has a bookstore, even a tolerant, a tolerance bookstore. <laughs> and, and, and then this uh, next. I was trying to make a room that, uh, when you're in it, it felt accessible symbolically from all sides. So, 360 degrees accessibility. And then this is the children's museum. Next. So inside. It's a big convocation hall uh, for banquets and meetings, and it, it brings in light from all of these uh, areas. And then the ceiling, next, has kind of an aperture. I think they're going to build it now. <laughs> next. Uh, this is Abu Dhabi where we're building a Guggenheim uh, art museum. It's uh, uh, 
the same uh, people that I did uh, the Bill Bow with. And we start out with uh, these models. I'm just showing you nine of them, but we had over 30 of them. And each one is a different, uh, they look kind of the same maybe, but uh, there, some are more compact, some are more expanded, uh, some are higher, some are lower. And, and we explored the cost differences between these strategies so that when we presented the alternatives that we considered to the client, they could uh, make a value judgment based on their budget. This was the, uh, this is the final uh, outcome of all of that. And it's a museum for art uh, and Islamic art, as well as uh, Western, as well as Asian art. So there'll be uh, a, a, a mixing of, of uh, world art. And uh, some of the meetings with the curators and the, and the artists have been extraordinary. And, and uh, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, I'm very excited about what this will, uh, will it could achieve in terms of uh, understand, cultural understanding between uh, different cultures. There will be uh, art and architecture and design as well. Uh, these are like the Indian teepee, so the hot air, the hot air goes up, up there. Uh, and it, it's a way of just, first of all, creating outdoor, uh, covered outdoor space for sculpture outdoors, and also for cooling the outdoor space. When we started, uh, all of the outdoor spaces were going to be uh, treated like this. Uh, after two years' work, uh, our client decided that the atrium had to be air conditioned. So it was a very complicated shift. But next. Uh, next. This is in uh, Miami Beach, Florida. It's a small concert hall and next to a park, and in the park there will be uh, seating to look at a, a uh, big screen of the conducting inside. And it's a, a very tight budget, so it's, it's really just the box with a glass wall, and then uh, <laughs> inside is this uh, little village of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, those rehearsal rooms. And and the concert hall is here, inside. Thanks. So from the park, this is the entrance, and you see this stuff. Next. And the concert hall is 700 seats. And it's uh, for Michael Tilson Thomas, who's the conductor of San Francisco Symphony. And uh, when he was eight years old, I used to babysit him. <laughs> So he, after the Disney Hall, he asked me to do his small concert hall. He teaches uh, inter on the internet uh, live, internet two, I think it is. Uh, so while he's teaching, he'll have projections on up above of a small orchestra, say, in it could be in Beijing or it could be anywhere, and he'll be the projection of the. Uh, the student orchestra, let's call it, will be visible, and they can see him, and he can see them. And they, they talk to each other and try. He'll do uh, a few, uh, you know, parts of Mahler or whatever. And, uh, and then the guy will, the young student will try it, and then he criticizes him. And it's an extraordinary experience. I, I've watched it a few times. It's, so far, he's only done it on a small screen, like half the size of this, this screen. But uh, 
So now he's going to be able to do it big next. So it can be done like that. Next. And they're building it. Next. Uh, this is in Manhattan. It's a small office building on the west, west side, west side highway. Uh, and these are many studies. Next, the final study. Uh, so it's not many floors. But when it was being built, the, uh, they got a lot of phone calls saying, your columns are crooked. <laughs> <laughs> but they could only build it because of the, the computer stuff that we use, so it makes it easy. You're going too far. So uh, you can see outside the building from here to here. So it looks frosted. I always tell people it just took it out of the refrigerator. If you wait, it'll thaw out. <laughs> Next. So you see, you can see. From inside, you can see. It's not claustrophobic here. And, and, uh, Pseudo company is doing a campus, and all their buildings look like this. And then they invited us to do a building that looks something different. Uh, this this is the one we built. It's a uh, for human resources, so it's sort of the center of the campus, and next to a park. Next, so these were our model pictures. There's uh, dining facilities and. In Basel, uh, they don't, this is a totally green building. I know everybody talks about green buildings. And most architects I know have been talking about green buildings since they, the beginning. I don't know, we always talked about energy saving. Nobody ever wanted to do it because it cost money to do it, but now people have to do it. Next. So there's a big central space and then offices, and public areas. Next. It's just nearing completion. The, let's go see if you can see it here, little squares. All of the ceiling, all of the roof glass is, uh, what else? <laughs> Technical block. Anyway, the, I can't describe it. <laughs> oh. Where? Here comes technical help. Um, anyway, the building is the ceiling glass is photovoltaic, so it gathers energy, and uh, there's a, a screen between the glass and the screen, for sunscreen. And uh, you got it. Maybe you're going to have to start asking questions. <laughs> Sooner. The best is yet to come, though, you know. <laughs> Very high tech here. Oh, uh, don't take pictures. I'm shy. Yeah.
Well, I'm not from the press, but I'm mostly impressed by your like, talk. Well, just a simple question is that, would you be prepared to do a project for Hong Kong, like a museum, in the future? Should I do a project here? Yeah, yeah. Will you be interested to do a museum for Hong Kong? Yeah, why do you think I'm here? <laughs> yes. I think we are doing something. Mostly LA artists. I have uh, uh, Rauschenberg and stuff. People who are a friend. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll do this quick and then we can connect. Thanks. So these, uh, these they're shades that come down and, and the hot air rises in that space. So when the shades are down, it's, you know, it's like a double skin. Yeah. But you can see out. You can always see out. Okay. And this is that main central atrium space. Okay. I was born in Toronto, Canada. And this is uh, uh, this was the corner that I used to spend. I used to come take a streetcar here. Uh, my grandmother's house is down the street. This is the Art Gallery of Ontario. And it was a very Jewish section, now it's a very Chinese section. <laughs> um, so maybe you can see some. And it's uh, a long, uh, take from this block to there, it's a long block. And I built this uh, uh, with glass, so there's kind of a mirror of the environment. Next. I was trying to incorporate the city across the road into the environment. And so when you stand here on the front porch, everything becomes like part of the art, part of the experience. Next. And people hang around out here. They start meeting there, and there's a, a bookstore and restaurant. Next. I don't have a picture of the gallery upstairs, which is a big wooden, beautiful gallery. These, these are the uh, uh, Canadian art art galleries. It's hard to explain, but, but it's very high gallery, and it's high because circumstance. The building was that high. In order to get the skylight, I had to open up to that. And the paintings are very small, so it's not for big paintings, but it, it does work very well. And, and you, have, you have to go there to feel it. But um, I, This is the best gallery I've ever done so far. <laughs> Next. Next. The uh, benefactor for the collection who passed away had a collection of ships' models, and so we made this uh, gallery with ships' models uh, for
for children to come and get involved with art. If children come to a, a museum, they would normally look at this first. <laughs> and on the walls, I, I convinced the, them to buy some uh, drawings by Van de Velde, the 17th century painter that, uh, of ships. So it's a, a kind of an introduction to art related to the topic that he was interested in. And the back, this is the park where I played as a, as a child. Next. Uh, this is in Manhattan. Um, it's a uh, residential tower. Uh, very tight budget, very, very constrained uh, uh, programming because uh, like everywhere, people want apartments that are normal. They don't want any fancy, because uh, they don't have furniture and they can't afford it. Uh, so I wanted to give it some life other than just a flat facade. And uh, so I, and I wanted it to, if they were just lined up vertically, it would be very static. And so I wanted to, to draw with it. Uh, like this. And in reality, these are bay windows in the apartment. So in the, in the living room, uh, for example, on this floor, the, the bay window is here, and then on this, on this floor, it moves over. And it just slightly moves over. So each apartment comes out slightly different. And you get this. Uh, and we were able to control the costs for this exterior within the limits of a normal flat curtain wall, which was kind of amazing. And the only reason you could do it is because of this bloody system of computers, which I don't know how to turn on. <laughs> as, as always, we studied many models. Many, many models. That's the building. It's at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Ground Zero is just behind it. So the Freedom Tower will be here, right, right there. Next. Next. And these are the mock-ups for the curtain wall. Next. And there, there's half of the building. That's. Uh, 39, it goes another 38 <laughs> floor. So from here to here, double. Think mm -hmm. of it. And this is the beginning of that curtain wall. So you see the, how they become bay windows <coughs> in each of the apartments. Next. Next. We're studying a vertical museum in a mountainous region. So it's in a, in a town where there are no high-rise buildings. Uh, but because of circumstance, the site was small, and it had to be a vertical museum. It had to be uh, like 30 stories high. How do you do that in a single tower in, a, in the mountains with mountains all around? And I started, these are all the studies of the organization of the inside. And then we started just taking rocks and piling them up and trying to see what, what that got next. So it led to this uh, model, which is made with rocks. And then punching, because it's a museum, pun punching windows, because there's the, the art that they're going to show is, does, uh, requires no, no exterior. All, all controlled lighting. So these windows would just be for the to light the public foyers, bridge and floors and so How do you do that? Next. So we studied various ways to do it. And these are blocks. These, each one of those is a block that's uh, one meter by two meters, say. And and those blocks, if they were stone, would be very heavy to make. And it would make the building very expensive. So we, next. So we found this um, 
a way of making the blocks out of aluminum. And these, uh, you could pick up one of those, one easy, you could hold it like this, it's very light. And those blocks, when they pile up against a very simple steel frame, and then, and then a waterproofing membrane, and then the blocks become the exterior skin. And they could be uh, anodized black or any color. And uh, with that system, you can arrive at a very uh, modestly priced tower for a museum. So uh, this, these are the kind of studies I love doing. I go crazy with this. I, uh, we're working on a project with tapestries now that I, I'm having a lot of fun with. And uh, next. This was the pavilion in, in, uh, for Serpentine Gallery. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Yeah. Next. Next. Uh, Thomas Adesh did a concert there. And then they took it down. It's gone. <laughs> Next. This is in Panama. Uh, my wife is Panamanian. And so her, her uh, country asked me to do a building at the Panama Canal. Very colorful. Next. It's a museum of biodiversity. Next. Next. Go back. <laughs> Next. Next. So they are building it. This is a, a work for an artist, for Sophie Kahl, the artist that asked us to do, had a competition for a phone booth. And the idea is that she will call the phone booth, and whoever answers, she'll record what they say, and then she makes a piece out of it for the future. And uh, this young lady is an architect, Megan, uh, and my son, and a few others. Um, Megan's idea was to make a flower, because whenever Sophie has a, a show, I send her flowers. That's become a thing over the last 10 years. And so we decided, she decided to make a flower phone booth. And the, but the thing we studied here, which is interesting, eh? architects are, you know, a painter can have a, a indeterminate edge, like, uh, like torn paper, and architects can't do that. We tr we're trying to get uh, closer to that immediacy that you find in painting of a, of a torn paper edge. And this is cast aluminum. It's the closest we've gotten to it. And then recently, as a, for a foundation, we designed a, uh, a, uh, a bench. Uh, stainless steel bench, which is going to be auctioned to you buy it. And we'd like to get a million dollars for it, so we give it to the foundation. But I think you can, get it, you can get it for less if you want. OK. I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Time for question again. Anyone? Yeah. Hi. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, materials and forms. Um, what about whenever you build a building? Um, the reference points of the surroundings, the culture, the climate, everything else. Um, how do we come into? I didn't, I'm not hearing you very well. Sorry. Hi. Yeah. Hi. You spoke a lot about materials, um, forms, shapes. Um, in, t in your architecture in the presentation earlier. Mm -hmm. But whenever you build a building, what about the surrounding areas, the, um, the climate, the terrain, the history, everything else? How do they come into your design process? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a normal architect. You know, I do, I pay attention to climate and site and client's program, client's budget, and all of those important things. And even green issues. I, we just don't talk about it that much because it, that seems so matter of fact and intrinsic to being an architect that, that it sort of seems like a given. Of course I do that. 
I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be allowed to build buildings if I didn't do that. It's very critical. I mean, you can see that 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 uh, even though I, you know, you can't escape your own language, and, and but I try to do. I try to uh, work with where I am, with the the place, the sense of place, and, and like the building for the mountains is, has has some gesture to to that place. Um, in the case of uh, this buildings like Bilbao and Disney Hall. Uh, since the beginning of architecture in time, uh, public buildings like uh, museums, art galleries, uh, courthouses, libraries uh, have have been uh, treated as as special in the city. So they they you go to cities and you see the the most iconic buildings are those public buildings. And so, in those cases, the the uh, it seems appropriate to make them special. Uh, but even Bilbao, if you have, if you just see the pictures of it and don't go there, you don't realize that it does fit and locks in very carefully. With with uh, which is something I I I feel it's important to be a good neighbor. Uh, even though I design buildings from the inside out, which people don't realize, they think I do it the other way, but uh, I don't. And so when you design from the inside out, you focus on the, the inside, but then you have to realize that you're a neighbor to somebody. And so there has to be attention paid to, to the exterior and sort of how it fits into the community, how it fits into the culture, how it fits into the program, and then the budget. Yeah. You have mentioned about the green issues for the architecture. I just wonder if there's any uh, environment concern for the for the uh, foundation the Louis Vuitton. The what? For the for the uh, foundation of the Louis Vuitton uh, museum, what yes. are the green concerns for yes. for that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and double yes. <laughs> I can't remember what they are right now, but <laughs> <laughs> but we yes, it is it is something. But we do it matter of factly. It's part of the. Thing. It's like, uh, it seems so irrelevant to talk about it now. It's become kind of a mantra. People get degrees in being green. And you expect to see somebody come in with a green suit. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it has become an excuse for a lot of bad architecture because it's accepted because it's green. But OK, but if it's green and ugly, then who cares? <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, so please uh, don't don't take the photos. Yes. Uh, yes, we we'll, uh, have the photo shooting later. Thank you. Mr. Gary, yeah. Hi. Oh, there you. Um, I'm an artist. I'm not uh, an architect. But uh, when I uh, look at your work, I think that your work is very sculptural. Maybe, actually, I I, I think that your no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think your work is very sculptural because I think that you're actually working from outside. I don't. You don't. No. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to make you one of us, but you know, of course. You're, 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 uh, well. All right. Well, you know, the issue is has become a hot button. I think it's less so now, but the last ten years, twenty years. So the artists have been worried about the architects are bigger. Actually, you're bigger. I think you. Mine's bigger than yours. So of course, of course. <laughs> that's why. That's why I love soccer. Jealousy. So, so, but that. So that makes you. 
uh, you don't want to get into that discussion, right? So, uh, okay, the other thing is uh, actually I, uh, I'm really interested in your drawing, even though you say that you don't know what you're drawing that. Uh, yeah, I draw a lot. I'm really, I'm really interested in what is the next steps after you make those drawings. Will somebody follow your drawing to make a model, or you try to make something out of that drawing? <laughs> wow. Let me sing link. Actually, I'm. I'm no, I think I think it's a discussion. It's a way of discussion with uh, my partners and with my colleagues that I work with. Edwin is here, Chan from from Hong Kong, right there. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I suppose he could tell you better than I can, but I think uh, it's a way of communicating and uh, it's a free association. I don't, that's why they're so loose. They're not, they're not intended to be uh, anything but a way of me seeing. It's hand-eye coordination. Finally, it's all about hand-eye coordination. I really believe that's, that's what architects do. That's what artists do. We're, we're, stream of consciousness from your head to your hand to something. And, uh, and the best artists are that. You can't explain how you got there, right? Yeah, I know. If, you, if, you, if, a... if you start to explain how you got there, it takes all the fun out of it. You know, <laughs> I don't like explaining it. Uh, so you have a very close assistant who worked for you for many years. That's why they can understand. No, not that. <laughs> Right, there are a lot of assistants. <laughs> Can I just ask one more question? Um, I understand that you've been working on a residential development in Hong Kong. Um, I'm just curious, what's... Is Edwin here? Okay. <laughs> um, what's the main difference between working on a residential development in a place like Hong Kong which is governed very much by, say, Chinese culture or Hong Kong way of life, as compared to doing things in Paris, for example? Well, it is different. Yeah. Um, first of all, residential is, in a way, less of a, uh, you know, it's a multiple, it's a multiple use thing, uh, and, and is, requires a certain discipline in, in the repetitive issue. You saw it in that high-rise building. I mean, the building is quite a normal building, a normal high-rise with the floor, pl floor plans are very efficient and all of that. Uh, less opportunity to be iconic like uh, the concert hall or like the museum and less reason to be that. More reason to be uh, uh, to deal with the fine grain of a of, of the multiple multiplicity of the uses within it. So it's uh, it's it just just designing museum, designing housing, two different things, right? And so the housing has, for me, has to be quieter. It's it's not uh, uh, so. Hey, look at me. It's not like that. Um, and then the cultural requirements and issues come into the planning of the floor areas and the uh, and a lot of discussion we had in the office. And of course, you know Edwin, he's from here, so it was uh, helpful to have him uh, sort of lead the way. Um, but sometimes he got out of hand. <laughs> Because he wanted to push it, you know, he probably because he had from here, like he felt licensed to to do things that I would probably have been too polite to do. Does that make sense? So it's it's very interesting dynamic, but it is a very personal thing, right? Yes. And it is a relationship, uh, and and it. Um, I've been here a few times. I don't say I know it. But uh, uh, I, I have a gut feel about it, that, and I think we responded to to those issues you're talking about. 
we'll only know when the building's done. I have a good track record for doing that, though. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Gary. Um, aside from your uh, building projects, you've also um, done smaller things like uh, watches for Fossil and uh, some jewelry for, for Tiffany. Um, what other non-building projects have you got coming up? And do the buildings influence the, the small objects and vice versa? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very similar uh, uh, you know, our, I, I've been designing furniture for years as part of my normal. Uh, and I love designing chairs. Chairs are just amazing because you got to find sort of the essence from a, an aesthetic point of view, an engineering point of view, all in one, all in one move almost. But you can't, you don't have much uh, space to, to so it's 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 got to either work or not, you know. And there, are some beautiful chairs made, but um, they aren't comfortable, maybe. Or so you, that's that's a, a really interesting place for me. I love whenever I get stuck or tired, I I draw chairs. <laughs> um, and it's very hard, and I love that it's hard. So it's that's a good, the the jewelry. I I didn't start to design jewelry. I started out to design uh, this kind of stuff, tableware and and uh, things like that. With Tiffany, they gave me the op uh, the opportunity to do that. And architects traditionally have done that kind of thing. I think uh, Alto, Alvar Alto, and Hoffman, and even Frank Lloyd Wright did lots of tableware, furniture, and jewelry. I think even Corbusier designed jewelry. Um, the nice thing about jewelry is it's it's for women, <laughs> so it gives me an excuse <laughs> to look at women. I have to study the context, you know. Um, but it's uh, and what's fascinating about jewelry, though, is is the craftsmanship. That these little things. There's you go to a, a little studio where there's a bunch of people at desks, and they're working like. And they hand make most of that stuff. It's all beautifully crafted, and and uh, you know it's different from architecture, which is so sloppy sometimes. <laughs> I don't know what I what I what else I'm going to do. I, if, if you got any ideas, give me a call. <laughs> I think we run out. Well, um. Not so long ago, um, Graham Coolhouse um, um, expressed some concern that there'd been. Uh, not so long ago, Graham Coolhouse um, made a statement where he expressed concern that there'd been a, an overdose of icons um, in architecture, that the market forces had led to expressions of extravagance. Um, what do you think about that statement, or those statements? Bullshit. <laughs> No, I think it, it's obvious what's happened, you know, that, that uh, we went through a period of the, the modernism where everything was sterilized and then people hated it because it wasn't humanistic, it didn't have any, any feelings, and so then postmodern guys brought history back and we started looking at it and say, why do we, why do we have to re rebuild the past if we want to go forward. So others like myself have said, well, let's find a way, a language that incorporates human, humanistic tendencies into the modern building character. Uh, and that's led to 
uh, for me, finding a sense of movement to replace decoration. That's all I was trying to do. Uh, I was emulating the Greek Phidias. I was emulating the, the uh, Indian dancing thing. Uh, and the, the notion that that's excess is, uh, it could be, and some people have done excess with it. Uh, Bilbao was built for $300 a square foot. So it may look excess, but it ain't excess. It was very modest. The concert hall was built for $215 million. At the same time, two or three other concert halls around the country, which are square boxes, were built for $300 million plus. Same program. So I don't think, I don't know what Rem, I mean, I hope he's not talking about me, but maybe he is. <laughs> I think that the danger is there's this backlash, and when you do that, the press buys into it because it gives them something to write about, and they start poking at it and making these statements like uh, they invented the term Bill Baufeck, they invented the term Starkitect. I hate those terms. But if you examine the Bilbao effect for what it is in Bilbao, uh, the first eight months the building was open, it paid for itself. Finished, $100 million, Boom. paid. And it's generated income that's on increasing uh, uh, scale. So this year it's over 300 million euros for the community because of the building. So is that excess? It was built for 300 bucks a square foot. It's delivered a lot. People like it. I can go there and live for free for the rest of my life. <laughs> I never have to pay for food or hotel or anything. Uh, I don't think that's excess. Now, you know, it, so, so you gotta be careful because you could drain the swamp again <laughs> and go back to banality as a, as a excuse for avoiding excess. And then you add the green bullshit on top of it, and it becomes like minimalist green is the future. And none of us will want to live in it, because it may, it may it'd be better to have global warming and get it over with than live in it. <laughs> so I don't know what Rem's talking about. He's, he's a really smart guy. I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, and I wish people wouldn't, if they're, if they're going to say something like that, they better explain it all in much more detail rather than just a broadside like that. I'm finished. Oh. Do you have a piece of favorite architecture in Hong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's here. I just, you know, you got to forgive me. I haven't seen everything. Uh, I know that, like every city, there's little gems here and there. <coughs> Certainly, historical buildings here that are quite beautiful. to Toronto for many years yeah. and I, I know um, the art gallery of Ontario pretty well and I'm so amazed that it is quite different from before. So um, when you were in the project, have you got any feedback from the community? Because it is like just one block down is um, uh, the Eater Center, another block down is the Chinatown. Have you got any feedback from, uh, from the community and how, how do you feel about the new building? Because it's not, it's not completely new, it is a uh, Have you seen building. it in person? Uh, not the new one, no. but I was there before when he was the old building. Yeah, we'll go see it. Because it fits, I'm extremely proud of how well it fits into the community. And I've had pretty good uh, press on it from the local press. Uh, so, and, and 
the uh, attendance records are have increased for the museum. People use it. And when I go there, uh, I was just there the other day, and people are saying, nice, 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 thank you. <laughs> so maybe a few, there must be somebody that hates it. There's usually somebody. <laughs> much nicer to see a lot of sunlight getting into the gallery. Yeah, yeah. It does, we try to, to uh, bring back the old building, you know, the Walker Court, because the, the remodeling before me uh, moved the entrance off axis, and I brought it back, which makes it much clearer when you go in. But you have to see it. It's, it's a remodeling job, so you, it isn't a, a new building. It's dealing with a lot of old parts and pieces. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Gary, for sharing your valuable experience, experience. And thank you, all of you, for your participation today. Uh, please give our hands to Mr. Gary. Thank you. Two more lectures given by the curators of exhibition at 10 and 2.30. For more details, please take a handout on your way out. And right after this, starting at 4.30, there will be a lecture by Mr. Richard Prince. Don't miss the chance to miss the artist of any time. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Clever from LBMA. Let's go back to the chair. Uh, you know, uh, 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 uh,